have in your house. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your son. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. He replied, There's not a jar left. And the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Amen. 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 The invitation song will be number 915. 915. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time to worship and to praise His name. Amen. I have a question for each of us. How many are really glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. 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 Psalm 34 and 3, David says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I uh, want to thank Brother Russell and the media uh, group for being with us on this morning. It's always a pleasure to be in uh, his company. Uh, his energy uh, is um, something that I, I just, I want more of his energy. He has a lot of energy. Uh, so I'm uh, thankful to see him and those that are worshiping with him on today. Uh, if you're visiting with us on today, you are our honored guest. Uh, please do not leave here today without us greeting you and getting to know you a little bit better. Please also stay as we have a fellowship meal uh, after our worship service on this morning. 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 is read into your hearing on today. Uh, this is a powerful text and it just shows the grace and mercy of God. Uh, as we look into this text today. The first question I want to ask you today is, do you ever feel trapped? Have you ever felt like you were at the end of your rope? What do you do when you reach that point? The realist would say, tie a knot and hang on. The pessimist would say, you might as well let go, it's only going to get worse. The optimist would say, well, just tie another knot and keep on climbing. Each of those has merits, but in reality, what can you do? There are some in that very place today. You are at the end of your rope, and there is a long drop beneath you, and you don't know what to do. What do you do when you're facing problems with your children that you cannot solve? What do you do when your marriage is on the rocks and the crashing waves of hopelessness are unrelenting? What do you do when there are problems at work and there seems to be no way out? What do you do when you have too much month left and not enough money? Amen. What do you do when you have followed a loved one's body to the graveyard and you cannot escape the loneliness, the grief, and the pain? What do you do when your heart is broken, your dreams are shattered, and your hopes have been dashed to bits on the cruel rocks of reality? What do you do when you're walking through a spiritual wasteland and there seems to be no way out? I don't think anyone but the Lord has the answer to all of those questions. But there may be some help for us here today as we read 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The Bible tells us that there was a poor widow woman who was at the end of her rope. She does not know what to do or where to turn in her pain and her prop and her poverty. She does the only thing that she knew what to do. She turned to the Lord. And when she did that, God came through in a very big way. The passage here teaches us the glorious truth that God has a plan for your problem. And these verses show us just as God took care of this poor widow woman, he will take care of you, he will take care of me. 
the passage lets us know that when we reach the end of our rope, there is help and there is hope. Amen. Three things I want to share with you on today. Look at verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 4. God knows your problems. The Bible says the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditors is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Now, there was despair in her family. The word cried means to moan, to weep uncontrollably, to shrek out of grief. In, in modern terms, we would call that the ugly cry. This word identifies the sound of a broken heart. This woman comes to the man of God at the lowest moment of her life. She is in desperate straits. Have you ever been there? There was not only despair in her family, but there was death in her family. She was married to one of the sons of the prophet. These men were who were in training under Elijah to be prophets and preachers in Israel. Her husband, her lover, her friend, her provider, her protector has been taken away from her in death. She is broken because a loved one has been taken away from her. Have you ever been there? There was also debt in her family. Since her husband is dead, she cannot pay her bills. And as a result, the creditors are now coming to take her two sons as slaves so they can work off her debt. This was allowed under Jewish law in Leviticus chapter 25. She has been deprived of her, of her husband. Now she's about to lose her sons. She is head over heels over her debt, and she doesn't know how she's going to make it. Have you ever been there? Amen. Amen. There was devotion in her family. And despite all of her problems, she is still held in the grip of her faith. She needs help, but she does not turn to her family. She does not turn to her friends. She does not try to find someone to loan her money. In her desperation, she turns to the man of God for help. Elijah was God's representative on hope on earth, and he was her best hope. She reminds Elijah that her husband did fear the Lord. He had a reverence for God. Her life has been a life of devotion to the Lord, and in her trouble, she still trusts God. Amen. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, how through our trials and our troubles and in our tribulations, God is trying to mature us. And so as we go through testing and trials and tribulations, we don't need to turn to other sources for help. We need to turn to the Lord. And in spite of her brain and her problems and her lack of possibilities, she still looks up to the Lord. And even though she couldn't see the way out, she knew that she couldn't see everything. Even though she didn't understand everything that she was facing, she still believed in God. Amen. And that he cared for her and that he could do something about her situation. So she cried out in and at some point, brothers and sisters, everybody in this room is going to arrive at a low point in your life. And there will come a day when you will reach the end of your rope. And some have already been there already. And they can tell us stories about it. And others are there right now and they're looking for some hope. Others will arrive there someday. We all have days of trouble and trial. Jesus says, in this world, you might have peace. I want that to just sink in your spirit right now. He said you might have peace, but you will have trouble. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And when you reach that point, the world, the flesh, and the devil will tell you that God doesn't care about you and that he doesn't see you. And the fact is, God does see you. 
He sees everything that you are facing. There's not a single thing that's hidden from his view. He cares more than you know. And he does want you to succeed. And these verses here in 2 Kings are designed to teach us that our problems, while they may be insurmountable, some of us go through things and they are mountains in front of us. These are God's opportunities in disguise. Therefore, no matter what you are called to face on in life, learn to trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. He cares. Amen. He's able. He will work in your need. Why? God knows your problems. Secondly today, look at verses 2 through 4. God releases our potential. Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. <clears throat> Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars. As each is filled, put one to the side. Now, it would have been okay or easy for Elijah to have said, okay, sister, uh, you have suffered enough. The Lord is going to meet your need. Just go home and wait for the Lord to work. Instead of taking that course of action, the Lord chose to involve this widow in her own miracle. First, he erased her faith by forcing her to admit what she didn't have. Then God expanded her faith by teaching her trust, humility, and obedience. And he will do that to you, and he does that to me as well. Amen. How does God erase my faith? And when I say my faith, I'm talking about my own ability to do things. The Lord erased this widow's faith by asking her two questions by Elijah. He said, what do you need? And then, what do you have? And by those two questions, the woman was made to see the size of her need and the smallness of her own resources. She needed everything. She had debt. She had very little, but she needed much, but she could not possibly have met her own need. And often God will use our troubles and our trials, our heartbreaks, our burdens of life to bring us to the place where we honestly see our need and our own inability to meet. Think about it. As long as I think I can handle things, why should I look to the Lord? If I have all the answers, why should I turn to the Lord to ask him any questions? But when we stop and honestly answer those two questions, we will realize we need more than we will be able to supply by ourselves. See, God does this to erase my faith. See, I need the Lord. I don't have what I need, and so I need God. He isn't trying to erase our faith in him. He is trying to erase our faith in ourselves. And as long as we think we can do it, God won't do it. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, you think you, got, you, you think you have all the answers and you can do it by yourself? Then do it by yourself. But when we come to the place where we know we need the Lord, and we are humble and we submit to him, then he will. Think about the battle in Joshua 7. Israel had just come off a great victory at Jericho, and they were feeling confident, uh, Brother Russell, in their own abilities. They failed to look to the Lord for the help they needed, and this little village should have been an easy victory, and it turned into a humiliating defeat. Yes, sir. And while Israel got their priorities in order and put God first, they were allowed to enjoy the victory, Joshua chapter 8. So God erases our faith, and then he expands our faith. And after God erases this, 
this uh, poor widow woman's faith in herself and her own abilities, he began the process of expanding her faith in the power of the Lord to meet her need. And he does the same thing. I'm sure many of us can testify to that. He also expands our faith personally. Elijah's second question, what do you have in your house? was designed to teach this widow that it may not have looked like you had much. But in reality, she had everything she needed to obtain what she wanted. She could see it though. But God has already given her the very thing he would use to meet her need. Her answer to Elijah is to tell him that all she has was a pot of olive oil. The pot refers to a flask. And this oil was probably a small amount of anointing oil used by the prophets to anoint the men of God. This little flask of oil had sat in the house unused since her husband died. That little insignificant flask of olive oil would be the answer to her prayers. And what we fail to realize is that God has already given us everything we need to get our needs met. That widow said that the only thing of value she had was a pot of olive oil. Yet you and I have so much more. Think about it. If you are a Christian, if you are a child of God today, he has promised to hear your prayers. He has promised to answer your prayers. He has promised to meet all your needs. And we look at our problems and they're just so large. Lord, this mountain is in front of me. We look at our possessions and they seem so small, yet we fail to factor God into the equation. So he places us. This morning we talked about mostly everything we go to is either God arranged or God allowed. God puts us in situations where our faith in him must be expanded. So God expands our faith personally and then he does so publicly. This woman is told now that you know that you have this little flask of olive oil. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go to your neighbors and I want you to borrow all empty vessels that you can get your hand on. Now that's a strange order. How do you suppose she explained this to her neighbors? Did she say, that crazy preacher told me to do this? Did she say, don't ask me why, but I need to borrow some empty jars and pots and pans? Did she say, I am flat broke, but God is able to meet my need? I don't know how he's going to do it, but the man of God has told me to go to my neighbors and to borrow some pots. I don't understand it, but I know God is going to make it. It may be God used her to speak to her neighbors. They might have just thought she lost her everlasting mind as she went door to door collecting those vessels. But, but what a witness it is or would have been when the Lord met her needs. God used her as a living, breathing sermon to her neighbors. See, people would rather see a sermon than to hear one. And he does the same thing in your life and in my life. We talk about how we love the Lord. And it's just words until the Lord sends us into the valleys of life. And when we are there, he comes through in a big way. It speaks volumes to those who are watching us. When you go through testings and trials and people see that you have a joyful attitude, it says something about people who are watching you. You never know who the Lord is using to, to your life to speak to. Let him use you in a mighty way. You are a work and we are a work in progress. Your life is a billboard advertising the grace, the blessings, and the power of God to a lost world. Amen. He expands our faith privately. See, faith moved in this widow's heart. She obeyed the Lord. 
she obeyed the Lord. She borrowed those vessels. And she and her sons, what they began to do was they shut themselves up in the house and then they trusted God to do what he had promised. Can you imagine the scene in this house that day? There is a mother and her sons and all these empty jars sitting all over the house. And she picks up a little flask of oil and one of those boys say, Mom, what are you going to do with that oil? Why did you borrow all of those vessels from the neighbor? And she said, boys, I don't have all the answers, but I believe that the Lord is about to do something great in our house. Your daddy didn't leave us much, but he did leave us this little flask of oil. And the man of God said that we are going to get all of these vessels. Uh, boys, God is going to fill each and every one of these vessels out of this little flask. And with that, they hand her the first one. Oh, this is powerful to me. They hand her the look, they hand her the first one, and she fills it up. She fills up one after the other. And the oil just keeps on pouring and pouring out of that little bottle until every vessel is filled. When that day ended, there was a mother and some boys who learned a valuable lesson. Amen. There is privacy of that house that they learn that God is all powerful and he is able to meet every need. Amen. The neighbors would hear that what God had done and they uh, would know it on an intellectual level. However, this family, they know what God had done. It was a public miracle done in the privacy of their hearts. Amen. And again, what the Lord does he shuts us up in a place of total dependence. His people will come and, and, and they will know that God has seen me through time after time after time. This was Elijah's experience in 1 Kings chapter 17. This was Daniel's experience in Daniel chapter 6. This was the widow of Zarephath's experience in 1 Kings 18. This was the experience of the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fishes in John 6. This was the experience of the disciples on the Sea of Galilee in Mark chapter 6. Mm -hmm. And this is the experience of you and me. Amen. Amen. Every day we see the Lord. He can take what we have and he can make more of it if we put our trust and dependence upon him. And when the Lord comes through for his people, the work that he does might be widely known, but the greatest work is in the heart of his children. Amen. Amen. And when the Lord moves in power, what happens is the child of God receives a lesson in faith. And that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to build lessons of faith that can never be taken away. Lord, you talk, you, you brought me through this one. I know you'll bring me through this one. And I know you'll bring me through this one. Your faith is expanded and it will never be the same again. Paul, he went from, who are you, Lord? Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. What made the difference in the life of Paul for him to ask the question about who is the Lord to now unto him? What made the difference was Paul's faith has been expanded on numerous occasions by the trials of life and the power of God. <coughs> and that is what the Lord is up to in your life and in my life. And in this story today, God knows our problems. He releases our potential. And lastly today, look at verses 5 of 2 Kings chapter 4. God gives our provision. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept them. When all of the jar, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. 
she went and told the man of God, and he said, now go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. <laughs> if I was a track runner right now, I would run around this building. <laughs> the woman and her sons, they filled one vessel after another until every vessel they had borrowed was full. She began the day with nothing. And she ended with everything. Don't we serve a mighty good God today? Yeah. Yeah. See, the lesson of God's provision, one of the lessons we can learn from this episode is that God will do exactly what he has promised to do. Elijah promised that the Lord would fill the vessels. Did he fill the vessels? Amen. He will keep all his promises to you. Not a single word and a single promise will fall to the ground unfilled. See, God will do everything he promised to do. He meant everything he said, and he will do everything he promised. Listen, there are over 31,000 promises in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God will, he has done or will do every single one of those. Mm -hmm. That's the lesson of God's provision. What is pro? Pro, he's already at the end. He already looked out for each and every one of us. The limit of God's provision. Listen, the oil flowed until the vessels ran out. If there were, if there were going to be more vessels, there would have been more oil. Amen. When the day was done, every vessel was filled to the full. There was no limit on the amount of oil. The only limit was the vessels. See, God's provision knew no limits in this widow's case. And it knows no limits in your case and in my case. God is able to meet every need, move every mountain, solve every problem. His provision is limited by nothing but our faith. Amen. See, Amen. God stands ready to give all that you make room for in your life. No more and no less. If we can trust him to take care of us, and if we get our vessels under the flow of his oil, then there's nothing that we can do. Amen. And when the day was done, there was enough oil in those borrowed vessel, vessels to settle her debts, to even, not only did she have what she needed, amen, she had some of what she wanted. And she has some to supply to her boys. See, God's supply was far more than sufficient. This is the ability of God. Amen. Amen. He is able to do more than we can imagine, but we have shackled ourselves because of our lack of faith. Yes. If we have small faith, we're going to get small results. But if I believe that God is more than able to do what he said, you will look up one day and be like, what just happened to me? Mm -hmm. It's because you have a faith. This is the kind of ability that God possesses. Get your vessels to him. What's our vessels today? You and me. Uh -huh. We are his vessels. And we need to watch God fill them up. Amen. Amen. The construction crew was building a new road through a rural area, knocking down trees as it progressed. A superintendent noticed that one tree had a nest of birds that couldn't fly, and he marked that tree so that it would not be cut down. Several weeks later, the superintendent came back to the tree, got into a bucket truck, and he lifted it up so that he could look into the nest. And to his surprise, he discovered that all the birds were gone. They had obviously learned how to fly. The superintendent then ordered the tree to be cut down. And as this tree crashed to the ground, the nest fell clear, and some of the materials that the birds had gathered to make the nest had scattered about. Part of it was a scrap from a Sunday school 
And on the scrap of paper were these words. He cares for you. Are you at the end of your road today? I just want you to know today that just as God took care of this widow woman, when she was at the end of her rope, God will take care of you. All you have to do is bring your vessel, let him amaze you with what he could do in your situation. Amen. Listen, we look at our situations and we just think, oh, there's nothing that can be done. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. And we just, just make so much out. I'm reminded of the story of John 5 where this lame man sat by this pool for 38 years. And one day Jesus comes by and he tells him to rise, take up your bed, and walk. He did that for this man after 38 years. Amen. And no matter how long you are have, or have been going through something, and are going through something, the Lord has the ability to change your situation. Amen. All we have to do is look to Him. I pray that this word has blessed you on today. Take 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and look at the power and the might and the strength and the glory of God through it. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're here today, you're not a Christian. How do I become a Christian on today? You hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God today. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. You must have faith. Then we just, then you repent. Repentance is a change of mind. It says no to sin and yes to God. No to my ways and yes to the ways of God. You, you make up in your mind that you are going to live a changed life. Amen. We ask you to stand before this wonderful audience and verbally confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when you do that, we'll baptize you today for the remission of your sins. What is baptism? It's a reenacting of the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. As Jesus walked the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows, he hung upon that old rugged cross and he died. Then he was buried. But that wasn't the end of the story. On one glorious Sunday morning, he was. Amen. That's the story of the gospel. In baptism, in your obedience to that, you will die of your old ways. We will baptize on you. We will immerse you, which represents your spiritual death. When you come up out of the water, that is your resurrection. That is your new life in Christ. Amen. Amen. So in your obedience to the gospel of Christ, you will be reenacting the same things that Jesus did. If you're here today and you need to become a Christian, you don't even have to wait until we start singing. You can come on up right now. We'll, and we'll take your confession right now. But if you stand in the need of prayer today, listen, we are a no judgment zone. Amen. 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 Sometimes in your walk of faith, you need the prayer. Of the church. Amen. Amen. Don't leave here today, please. And you have had something that you have been going through and, and you don't know what to do or where to turn. He will pray for you. Or if God has blessed you beyond measure and you just can't keep it in, you want to tell somebody. Amen. <laughs> we'll rejoice with you. Let's understand. When we walk with